Richard Thornton. Welcome to part three of our series on the Mayas of Campeche. In this video you'll be seeing images that very few people have ever seen and probably never will see. It covers the three days that future anthropologist Ana Rojas and I spent wandering through in an unknown land in the heart of the Yucatan Peninsula, the eastern Piuk Hills. We discovered several ruins of ancient Maya towns that were concealed by jungle foliage and probably unknown to archaeologists. Back in 1970, the Eastern Pilk Hills form an enormous blank area on state and national roadmaps. We never were really sure if we were in Campeche, Yucatan, Quintana Roo, or Guatemala. Being before the days of GPS navigation satellites, all we had for navigation was a compass. At that time, the region had no electrical telephone lines, almost no paved roads, no stores, no gasoline stations, almost no signs no metal fencing, and very few automotive spills or trucks. There were some ancient stacked stone walls in most parts of the Yucatan Peninsula which functioned as fences near Maya hamlets or houses, and in the extreme southeastern portion of Campeche also saw fencing made from saplings. Now, this is the type of fencing we believe the Creeks used in their temples and, their, and around their gardens. We could go for hours on the one lane dirt roads about seeing another vehicle. We also never saw a person riding a horse or burro, or not even riding on a mule drawn wagon. There were no visible evidence of any level of government or law enforcement agencies. On the other hand, crime and violence were virtually unknown from what we understand. Unless they were hitching a ride on an old farm truck, the Maya people there walked everywhere. The lines were very little different than those of their ancestors a thousand years earlier. Anna and I were one of the last people to see this ancient way of life before the Mexican and Campeche governments began paving roads, constructing local electrical plants, extending lines to outlying areas from those plants, and in larger villages excavating wells with electric pumps. From there, they installed water lines at least to serve the areas around these communities. Oh, did I mention that there are no rivers or creeks in the Puyo Hills? At least we didn't see any. The only source of water are sinkholes, which the Mayas call cenote. In former times, they had to drop pottery down into these sinkholes to obtain water. The slides that I took while we were wandering through those three days through the jungle of eastern Campeche were almost forgotten after 50 years. The couple of slides I took while roaming the Pure Kills were funded by the first Barrett Fellowship, awarded to me by Georgia Tech. Copies were given to the Georgia Tech School of Architecture Library, but I actually never looked at them until the winter of 2021 and 2022. Here's what happened. I dropped them off to be developed at the Kodak Lab in Atlanta in mid-September 1970. They were mailed back to me in early October. By then I was extremely busy with school, so took the slides from the Kodak container and directly packed them in tightly 
into a metal slide storage box. I never used these slides from the days when we roamed the Puyuk Hills in classes that I taught at Georgia Tech or in subsequent lectures given in the years that followed. Thus, for five decades, these slides were never removed from the steel box in order to be fried by a slide projector or exposed to dust, lint, and bacteria. It only took a brief amount of computer work to restore the digitized copies to their original color. When I arrived in Campeche City, I was surprised to find it to be a beautiful city of seldom visited by foreign tourists. It had changed very little since the 1800s. Uh, there was not set up for tourism. Perhaps because he was grown up in Campeche, Dr. Ramon Pinachan, my fellowship coordinator, had assigned me 14 cities to visit there. Yet, not one of those Maya cities could be accessed by a public bus. How in the world was I going to reach them? Worse still, several of these archaeological sites could only be accessed by a jeep. They were impassable to normal automobiles. Eventually, I was directed to the office of Mr. Rojas, who provided logistics support for scientific expeditions by universities, mostly from universities in the southeast. Senor Rojas told me of two archaeological sites on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico that I could reach by public bus from Campeche City. He then invited me to dinner with his family that evening. That was a surprise. The Rojas family lived in a, I guess you'd call it a hacienda, but only that time had about five or seven acres of land attached to it, but it was a beautiful setting to have an outdoor dinner with the family. After the meal over after dinner cigars, the three adults in the family stayed at the table with me to discuss a business proposition. What Senor Rojas proposed was that his daughter, Ana, use her Jeep to give me a tour of Campeche, and in return for me spending time with her to teach her the, the basics of Maya architecture, the cost would be nominal. Ana wanted to get licensed as a bilingual tour guide for Maya sites, and she had to be knowledgeable on Maya architecture as part of the exam in order to be certified. Both of us were 21. Anna was just two weeks older than me, but she balked at the request that she take me off into the jungle the following morning because she had planned to go shopping with her girlfriends in Merida the next day. So while Anna and her father argued and bargained in another part of the house where we couldn't hear them yelling, I sat down with Gabriela Rojas and found her very charming. She had been Miss Campeche in her youth. A very interesting lady. Well, Anna and her father eventually returned to the dining area. Anna being uh, severely chastised, she politely told me that she'd be delighted to leave the next morning to go on a tour of the archaeological sites in Campeche and that she was looking forward to it. So the next morning about 8.30, Anna and I headed eastward to our first site, Edna. She was businesslike to the point of being curt. Uh, obviously did not want to be there with me, but I didn't plan on anything being more than a business relationship between us. What I did not count on, however, was Anna dropping me off to stay at a hut at a brothel complex while she headed to the beach to attend a party. Let's just say the hostess of my hut was not appreciative of the fact I didn't want to rent any of her three teenage daughters. That didn't go well at all. Anna was a different person, though, when she came by the next morning to pick me up, and things started to warm up very quickly, especially when we settled into our little hut that we were going to be based in for five days. Our relationship changed radically that afternoon when the hostess of our new cabin gave us a wedding feast. She thought we were newlyweds. 
That night, we set up sterno lamps and danced to an eight-track player uh, to rock music and romantic music, and things warmed up very quickly, let's just say. It was a night I will never forget as long as I live. Well, let's just say that the next morning, Anna was one happy camper. We spent three days going to the major Maya cities that had been assigned to me by Dr. Pina Chan. We were getting along so well. I can't say we were in love at that point, but we were very, very comfortable with each other. So we decided to add on two or three more days and explore the compost or the jungle of far eastern and southeastern Campeche. Anna said it had always been her dream to do something like that, just to spend several days into the jungle. But it was never safe for her to go by herself, and her father would have forbidden it when she was younger. But with me as her bodyguard, we were very safe. We had a rifle with us that her father had given me to protect her. Our first adventure began earlier than expected. We were driving on about the only paved road in that part of Campeche, the main highway between Merida down through the heart of Campeche into Chiapas. We noticed a road turning off to the side, and at the time there was no sign, it was just a gravel road. So it seemed a little bit better than a dirt road. So we turned right, not knowing where we were headed. Where we were heading was Chocolat. Not only did we not know where we were headed, we also didn't realize that we were passing from Campeche into Yucatan, and then would be going back into Campeche again before arriving at Chocolat. The gravel paving ended only about a kilometer or six tenths of a mile beyond the paved road, but we kept on going. We had no idea where we were heading. We entered a region of a one lane sand road and vast stretches of corn or cotton fields as far as you could see in some places, and not a single house. It was really odd. No signs, no houses, no fences, no signs of anybody. Anna said she thought most of the corn fields were owned by wealthy families in other parts of Mexico that came in once a year to plant the corn and then came back the next year to harvest it. We saw no signs of tractors or barns or anything, so that obviously the, any equipment used to plant these crops were trucked in and then trucked out. They did not have anything to do with the Mayas. She said the Mayas had to uh, farm next to their villages in small plots that they eked out of the jungle called milpas. We'll talk about that later in the program. We had no idea where we were going. As you see, there are no signs, nothing, no power poles, nothing. But we ended up going 14 kilometers or 8.66 miles uh, of scenery just like that, or traveling at the edge of the jungle. Then we started seeing some old Maya houses. I don't even know what this is. Other than the fact that we were beginning to see houses, some of them extremely old, there was nothing to tell us that we were in a community. But it was obvious this was a very ancient Maya village or town or maybe even a city at one time. The houses were quite old, all in the traditional size. For the most part, there were some houses that had concrete block or stone masonry additions constructed beside them. But uh, there's no commercial buildings coming into the town, at least until you got to the central plaza. Here you see a stone building has been added to a traditional Maya hut. And there's another Maya hut behind it. I'm not sure what this is. Some type of fenced in there, but I can't really can't tell. Maybe it's a chicken pen. Then we came to a house, noticed a stone building beside it. I think at one time this was the house of a chieftain or a, a village foreman or something like that. What we would would see in some cities in the southeast. Notice the stone base and the steps. It indicates status, like a mound. Here's a very ancient fence made from uh, saplings and a compound around a central plaza. I think this is very close to what our original Maya farmstead looked like. Then we reached the center town. It was an oval plaza with a few commercial buildings. This had a restaurant in front. I'm not sure what it was. 
Notice the three steps like we saw in the chieftain's house. This may have been something like a city hall one time, but it was being used as a restaurant when we got there. They had an electric generator in back to run the equipment and had a bathroom. This is Chocolat today. Notice that it now has formerly dedicated streets. When we were there, there were no real streets. There was an oval plaza and then more or less pass running between Maya huts. Now we look at it closely, you can somewhat make out the oval plaza, but it's all changed. There's some type of building been erected in the center of the plaza, and there's other smaller buildings. Let's regress a moment to discuss the cultural history of the Campeche Mayas that were presented in part one of the series. As many of you are aware, the videos and documentaries one sees on the Mayas that's produced out of the mainstream networks tends to always say that the Maya civilization mysteriously died out around 900 AD. That is not true. Certain cities did collapse, but certainly that was not the case in Campeche. Most of the cities we were visiting of the three-part cities continued to be occupied and thrive in various degrees up until the early 1500s when a massive smallpox plague introduced by the Spanish caused the population to collapse catastrophically. There was a population collapse in much of Campeche, but it was not around 900 AD as in other parts of southern and eastern Maya lands, but rather in the period between 550 and 600 AD. Anthropologists are not sure where these people went. The same ethnic group seems to have continued living in that region, just in fewer numbers. That question weighs very heavily on the next discussion we're going to have about Chocolac and its similarity to a town site of no place other than the Nacuchi Valley of Georgia. About five years ago, I became aware of a town site with two mounds that was excavated by Robert Washup famous archaeologist in 1939. It's very close to the community of Salty in the Coochie Valley. Washup didn't think anything unusual about either the architecture or the shape of the plaza of this town, other than he thinks this was the original Chickasaw town. At least we have the Chickasaw architecture seems to develop from this site, which is known as the Eastwood site. This town in the Coochie Valley is thought to have been founded around 600 AD. What's even more interesting is that it probably looked very similar to what Chocolat looked like in the period between 500 and 600 AD. Is there a connection? We need to investigate that further. There appeared to be a major boulevard leading northeastward from the plaza at Chocolat. At that time, it was defined by two stone walls and a dirt road. It does not look as polished as it does today. However, we followed that road. And lo and behold, we came to an archaeological zone. It did have a sign that said it was Chocolat. At that time, the archaeological zone consisted of a Maya hut for the caretaker and a restored front facade. The work seemed to be continuing, but there was only one side of the building at that time. I'm sure it looks very different now. In doing research for this video, I learned that the Chocolat Palace was visited by John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood in 1838, and Catherwood did a sketch of the palace. This is what it looked like back in 1970. We didn't see any pyramidal temples, so evidently Chocolat back then was a, let's say, a regional administrative center, and this was the headquarters of the local government. Beautiful stonework, though, in the Puig style. This is Chalk the Rain God. I'll have another view for you in a second, showing the side view. Very well preserved. There's, very, there's been no damage to it. This is one of those cities that was occupied until around 1500 AD. Notice how the facade of the second floor seems to replicate vertical logs. That's a style of architecture we have not seen today in, in uh, residential architecture, but evidently was practiced back then 
in the Classic period and early post-Classic period. Anna was wrong about all the land between Zuckerlock and the highway being held by absentee landlords. I, I spied a, a piscina y Hadal as we were driving back into the village, the archaeological site. That means it's the office of the Hido. Hido was the equivalent of a kibbutz or a commune, which means that all that land is owned communally by the Mayas living in Shokalak. That would explain a lot why we saw no stores, fencing, uh, outbuildings. It's, it's communal farmland. The Mayas in Shokalak would also own the forests and the jungles that we passed through. This entire track line is it's something akin to a Indian reservation, but but functions more like a kibbutz. 61% of the land in Campeche today is owned communally by the indigenous miners living there. We headed south on a road from Sokolok that had pretty much the same scenery as the road we'd come in on, but we just kept on heading south not knowing where we headed. Eventually we came near Highway and I saw this strange house. You look closely, it's a mound and a former temple site. Now we're finding sites like this in Union County, Georgia, that just used uh, fill stone to create terrace walls. However, at the time it didn't really mean much to me. I just thought it was interesting that it was an archaeological site with a house on it. We went east on a paved highway for a while until we saw a trail log going off the side that had fresh jeep tracks. We thought this might be leading to something interesting. It turned out it did. We drove on for maybe two or three kilometers. At the end of the Jeep tracks, we came to what was an old Maya trail, and we also noticed many stones that looked like the ruins of buildings. So we decided to walk down the path rather than risking the Jeep. And sure enough, we started seeing definite stone ruins of, of both buildings and agricultural terraces. Then we kept on going. We had a feeling we were going to find something. And we did. Lo and behold, there in the brush, was a Stella laying on its side. I think it was a Stella, but it was a very different style than what we'd seen elsewhere in the Chines and Piuk style buildings to the north. As you see here, the style of that Stella we found in central um, Campeche, very similar bas relief to the one at Chichen Itza post-classic style at the ball court. Five decades later, though, I found this very similar style of carved boulder of all places in Habersham County, Georgia, northeast Georgia, near where the Soki River flows into the Chattahoochee River. Were the same people who carved both? I don't know. We're still trying to get permission to get a detailed photograph of the, of the art so we can compare it to Mesoamerican art, but as you can see, from this smartphone photograph that is a similar style of workmanship. As then I walked through the jungle, we generally found just loose stones with collapsed buildings, but occasionally we'd find something really interesting, such as this basin, I assume it's a basin, carved out of limestone to store water. Uh, whether it was for drinking purpose or some type of processing, I don't know. Here we see a carved boulder it's overgrown with, with vegetation, so it was very difficult to make out what it exactly it was. It appears to be a cold snake. And here I found another uh, fallen Stella or carved boulder. Without the, the clean details of the other one, I think it's more or less the same image, but has been worn by time and, and, and perhaps been intentionally vandalized. We continued walking along the trail, hoping to find a, a building that I could photograph, but what we mainly saw were just appeared to be hills. We knew there were buildings inside the hills, but I was not an archaeologist. I certainly couldn't dig inside of them. But we decided to spend the night there and set up camp for the day and, and hoping to find at least one building I could photograph, but I never could. All I found was vegetation going over hills, which we knew inside were buildings. We started off the next morning early heading in a generally southeastern direction on the, the uh, old road, looking for things that might be of interest. We arrived at a, a paved highway with no identifying signs. We decided to turn eastward and headed towards Quintana Roo. 
Off in the distance, we noticed a smoky haze and was curious what there was, so we kept on finding roads that would head us in an eastward direction. As we traveled southeastward, the rainforest became choked with smoke. We didn't see any fires. Eventually, we reached a point east enough where that we realized it was not one forest fire, but a series of small fires creating a vast wall of smoke. And I correctly interpret the situation as being a the time of year when the Mayas practiced slash and burn agriculture, at least they did back then. In the spring they cut out an area where they planted the farm and let the vegetation dry and then in the late summer or early fall they start burning it. The uh, next year they're able to plant a variety of crops and the soil is fairly fertile. They've been doing this for probably thousands of years. This is something you won't see much of anymore. It is now illegal in Mexico to burn virgin forests. You only can practice slash and burn agriculture in areas that had formed been in an agricultural use. And in fact, several Mennonite farmers have been arrested for doing just that, burning virgin forests. It's an interesting process though. You'll never get to see it. In this case, we're looking at a village at a distance where they're burning lands uh, right next to the huts. Saw a man here, looked like a, some type of spear or, or just a stick. He was tending a fire as he drove past him. I noticed that the Mayans were very careful not to build fires that could get out of hand. What they typically did is pile up small burn piles, then come back and burn the entire surface. The end result would look something like this. I don't know what they do with the stumps. It seemed like you'd have to cut them down. Here's the one with all the tree stumps left. And I really don't know why they were clearing land on a hill. It could not be used for growing corn. Here's another hill they burned down. Perhaps for pasture, but I didn't see any cattle either. I think we were in Quintana Roo, or right on the border here, judging from the terrain. This is what a milpa looks like the first year. That's what you call the slash and burn architect agriculture. A variety of plants are put in the fields. Here you see two corn fields, one that's a second year and one that's a third year milpas. Here's another milpa where you see a variety of plants, squash and corn being planted. There's two farmers. They said they were going to get a good crop of corn that year. Here's some of the plants I went back and identified by blowing up the slide. This is a third or fourth year mill that is beginning to be non-productive. And here's a village in which they seem to be practicing milk and agriculture right next to the house. It seemed dangerous, but the gardens didn't look that productive anyway. We quickly got tired of the choking smoke and headed south again. Then I came across one of the most amazing sites in my time in Mexico. This is a 20th century temple built on top of an ancient temple base. Notice the stones. And we're finding small mounds like this with stone facing in North Georgia also. Now we know what we're finding. And these are, are perhaps temples for the common folk. Deep southeastern Campeche came across a site named Chuhub. There was no information about it. There was a gate open and immediately inside the gate was a sign saying it's prohibited to go in there. Technically I could have gone anyway because I had a INH pass but I didn't know about Anna. Thanks to the internet and, and uh, Google Maps we now can find out about such places. Here's a satellite image what the site looks like today. When I was there, they were just beginning to excavate it. There was not much information on the site at all that you could t make anything out of it. Here's another site we visited, Chicana. It reminded me of a Gothic cathedral. It was a beautiful building. This is Hoshob, which also is beautiful. The, the ornate stonework. Here's another Schlalotpak. Same type of ornate stone architecture. And then we started heading home. It was the third day was coming to a close. And late that 
afternoon, actually it was dark, we arrived at the home of the Rojas family. Arnaldo and Gabriela Rojas were waiting for us underneath the front portico with somewhat pensive look on their faces. Then they saw that Anna was smiling radiantly and they started grinning ear, ear to ear. Anna raced up to her father, hugged him and kissed him on the cheek and told me he was the most wonderful father in the world, and of course in Spanish. Simultaneously, Gabriela came up to me and hugged me and said, thank you for making my daughter happy again. I'll never forget your kindness. Uh, I, I, I like that kind of kindness. Then she told us, uh, you two need to go take a bath and clean up before dinner. I guess I should tell you that Anna had not had a bath or a shower for five days. We'd been in the jungle together. I had not had a bath or shower in six days. So I imagine they would have more pleasant time at dinner with us cleaned up and looking pretty. As I was coming back, cleaned up and heading to the dining area, Arnaldo handed me a big wad of pesos and told me to take Anna out to the hotel ballroom the next night on him. And they asked, is this enough money? I said, oh yeah, this is more than enough money. The next morning, Gabriella announced to me at breakfast, I said, you know my daughter is, how you say in the United States, a tomboy? Well, I want you to know that, that Anna can be a beautiful Mexican senior too. We're going into town to get her a complete makeover. I have to admit, when Anna returned at lunchtime after a makeover, I kind of stood there and gawked. This is the gal I've been with for six days. I took a photo of her clowning in the bar just before we were going into the restaurant. And from the restaurant, we went to the ballroom to a live rock band. Had a wonderful night. It's one of those things you'll never forget. I'm sure she doesn't either, even if she doesn't tell her husband about it. The next two and a half days, she showed me the historic buildings in uh, Campeche City, and then it came time for me to get on the bus to head to Tabasco. Her university started classes in two weeks, but I invited her to come along with me on the bus when I was touring sites in Tabasco and Veracruz. Her parents wholeheartedly endorsed it, but she backed out. Uh, she regretted it later, but she said she would afraid she'd become addicted to me and she wouldn't be able to concentrate on classes. She had two more weeks with me. And now for the rest of the story. During the, the last two and a half days I was there, Anna and I stayed together in the guest quarters. So it was obviously her parents had accepted me as a part of the family. Just before getting on the bus, they invited me to spend the Christmas holidays with them. I accepted. Then three weeks later when I arrived in Atlanta from Mexico, there was a letter waiting for me from her parents inviting me to go on a Caribbean cruise with them during the Christmas holidays. They were picking up the tab for everything, including my airplane flights. And they also strictly made it clear that we would have separate rooms from them. Then I got the news a few days later that the cruise would not arrive to land until January 6th, but Georgia Tech had registration on January 3rd, which was an impossible situation. We had manual registration back then. I had no option. I had to be there to register. Anna assumed that I had a girlfriend in Atlanta, which was just not the case. And that kind of set the tone for the next three years. We were always out of sync with each other. One would be with someone, while the other wasn't. One would be out of the country, while the other wasn't. But we always thought of each other as the ideal mate for our lifetime. We just were always out of sync. So it's a, it's a love affair that could have been, but didn't, but we still have those beautiful memories. And that ends our three-part series on Campeche. Thank you.